Buen día a todos quienes hoy nos... Good morning to everyone who is connecting on this second day of the call 2021 and the fifth Latin American meeting on e-science. Yesterday, we not only celebrated the start of the conference, which has been ongoing for 11 years, but we also kicked off the Bella Programs Connectivity. And this resonated with me f during the day, as I'm sure it did with everyone who has been working for years in achieving this dream. In 1967, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the great Beatles, inoculated our hearts worldwide with a solid message through their song, All You Need Is Love. Yes, all we need is love. It might seem strange that I'm referring to this, but it actually isn't. Since our job, the jobs of all the men and women who dedicate our efforts to academic networks, it's a job that, that's done out of love. And if what we process and try to promote is global collaboration, working together. And that is precisely the subject that will form today's session, which is being directed with the slogan of rethinking higher education institutions and their role in reducing the digital gap. Reducing the digital gap is a mandate. It is a mandatory task because here, no one can be left behind. It is in essence, an action of love. And someone who knows a lot about this and who has a collaborator for Red Plata is the School of Physics at the Santander Industrial University in Bucaramanga, Colombia, and one of the leaders of the La Conga Physics Project. Go ahead, Luis. Thank you, Maria Jose. You made me blush with all those compliments. This opportunity, and, and this is why your words resonated with me, uh, on this opportunity, or rather 40 years ago, well, 30 years ago, 1991, we began to connect Venezuela to the internet. And since then, just like you're saying, it's been a, a matter of love. And it's a great pleasure for me today to introduce Martin Hilbert, who is one of my heroes. And ever since that conference in Cartagena, many of his words still resonate with me today. If you, if you have 200 likes, I will know you better than your own mom knows you. And with that, that, that really stayed with me. And I've always thought of uh, Martin since then. And for those of you who don't know him, he is a communications professor at uh, the University of California, UC Davis. He has two doctorate degrees, which I think is, 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 is crazy to be able to do something like that. I only have one. And for several, and, and some years ago, we came together uh, and he helped to organize the United Nations program for Latin America and the Caribbean. And while his work is widely known in academic circles, but also beyond that in magazines and newspapers throughout the world, he's a polyglot, he speaks five languages. He was saying today that he feels so just as uncomfortable in English as he does in French and others. So with that, you have the floor, Martin, and thank you for joining us today. We're all ears. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I've always, I've always been a big fan of Tikal and the clatter from the very first moment it began when we worked in, in the Alice 2 projects. I don't know if you remember those projects in the early 2000s. In 2005, 2008, um, I was at Safal and Ray Clara was there as well. And ever since then, we've had a very firm uh, connection throughout uh, my career in, in understanding this digital paradigm in which we are all in and in which you especially now under the pandemic, we can see how important that is in these times. And in 2003, 2005, maybe people didn't take us as seriously, but now 
or at least now. I think after the pandemic, I think in, in political circle, even the last person in political circles understands that it won't go away anytime soon. And it's also affecting the global economy yeah, for the last uh, year and a half. And there are also many challenges that we have. And, and we are evolving into the future. And in fact, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. We're calling this social computing. And basically, I would like to pose three subjects. The first is the power of the artificial. This has to be understood uh, as, uh, as such. And again, the internet is still moving forward and, and uh, art of artificial matters are still not over when you think about blockchain and other technologies to come. So it's still moving forward. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what we've researched thus far. And then there's also the power of the human with the artificial, because the human will not go away. And that's really important, especially with uh, Tikal when speaking of education. That's really important to remember that humans will not be replaced. Uh, the, role, the roles might be changing, but the human aspect itself will not go away. And we will need that still in the future. And then some of the negative side, the power of artificial over the human. You might have seen the uh, document uh, documentary on the, the social dilemma where uh, that addresses uh, this fact uh, or this concept uh, as a whole. And we'll be looking at that in a presentation. So again, the negative side, the power that artificial has over the human uh, because uh, technology does have its negative side. But if you imagine 100, 150 years ago when the automobiles were introduced, no one would have thought that the issue of global warming would come in turn. In automobiles in cities at the time was that they would clean the cities because the cities were full of horse excrement. And it was a major health issue a public health issue. So 150 years later, we realized, whoops. So the digital, again, does have uh, many positive things, but we are also learning. We're learning about these things still. Nobody knows everything yet. So we must always keep an eye on that as well. So with that, I'll be concluding the presentation today. So let's begin with the power of the artificial. And if we open the large curtain, we see that technology has always helped humanity. We can distinguish development eras for humanity by technology. So the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the, the, the Iron Age, and then of course the revolutions uh, around energy where we initially transform materials and then we focused on transforming energy with different technologies. And now we are transforming information. And this also has other other uh, longer waves. These are long waves. These are paradigms. Contrative, uh, contrative waves, depending on how you pronounce it. But these waves take uh, that traditionally take 30 to 40 years, uh, but are also becoming increasingly shorter because of innovation as well. The first long wave here, uh, uh, and, and while well, many of our friends here in the room know about this working in communications, we, we discussed telecommunications extensively when we began in the 90s. That was the major issue. And, and things have been resolved over time. People now have information traveling at the speed of light on hand in their pockets, be it through a short radio, be it through fiber optics. And the speed of light, according to Einstein, is the fastest you can travel in the universe. So we still have some ways to go with the digital gap. You know that I'm also concerned with that. But now the big picture, well, well, we're there now with, with, with data and big data, especially information, data, communications. And now we are entering this paradigm of knowledge which has to do with algorithms and knowledge. This is about transforming this data and information into something useful, into a process that takes place over time. What I have called 
the algorithmification. Now, I am German, so I am allowed to invent long words that no one can pronounce. So the algorithmification, that's where we are now, where digital we had digital information and now this. And this paradigm has come quite far. This isn't something that's far in the future saying, look, we're, we're, we're about to enter into the knowledge age. No, we are there now. And if you look at the most valuable companies in humanity's history, it hasn't changed much in recent years. You can see, well, okay, two have has switched places here. And then as you move forward, oh, it changed once again. But not much is happening here. These are the five largest companies that are ruling the global economy. And this isn't the future. This is today. This isn't about the electric wave coming. No, these, these companies have more money in, in pocket than any bank. Or, you know, we fight wars, they're they're, there's nature, the environment. No, those are not the ones ruling the economy. It's not the Shells and the Exxons. They haven't been for many years. It's these companies. And they all, and these are all artificial intelligence companies. We don't see major telecoms uh, ruling the economy either. No, it's artificial intelligence and knowledge. So this knowledge paradigm is already ruling the global paradigm. And they're quite powerful. If you take the top 10 digital entrepreneurs, the top, top 10 richest that we have, which are mostly white males, paradigm of artificial intelligence, they have so much money in their pocket that 80 40 percent of all countries in the world they have, they have more money than all of these countries more than the gdp of these countries i'm not saying the savings accounts for these countries now these 10 gentlemen have more money cash in pocket than the gdp of 40 percent of all the world's economies together or if you look at it a different way if you look at individual economies 90% of the world's economies, GDP, when looking at the GDP, the, these 10 gentlemen have more money than these 171 countries. Only the Brazilian economy would have more, uh, from Brazil and, and up, and up is, is one of the countries that has more money than, than these individuals. That's a lot. I mean, these these ten gentlemen, if they were in a room together, imagine imagine what they could do. Now that's a party. They have actual power. This is ninety percent of the world's economies. But how much power do they have in the real world? So this knowledge paradigm has gone quite far. And that's what I'd like to talk about. So I'm still distinguishing between information. Information can be imagined. For example, the information paradigm can be imagined with what we do here. We take reality and we take data from that. This is an agricultural application that we have here. And basically what it does, what this company does is digitize what's happening on the land in Uruguay. So you take the various layers and you see how much phosphorus there is and how much nutrition can be found in this land. And then, uh, well, this company was uh, acquired by Bayer, a, a company that sells fertilizer. Uh, they have Monsanto. So what they do is digitize the ground in Latin America and see how much phosphorus there is and, and see what can be planted there. Then the idea is to, of course, algorithmify this. They take the data and then they use that for agriculture. Once it's fully automated, these robots on their own would do the actual agricultural work. But it begins with information. First, we need to digitize the land in Latin America, just like Facebook and Google digit or Amazon digitize consumer behavior. And then what I do with this knowledge 
hasta el conocimiento para automatizar los procesos. I take this knowledge to automate processes, and for that I use machine learning. And in machine learning, I change the creation and knowledge paradigm because it automates knowledge. I know there are many education experts here, so let's see what machine learning actually does. Artificial intelligence today is 95% machine learning. There is There are other types of artificial intelligence, but it's mostly machine learning, especially supervised machine learning. All of the all this image recognition, all of the self-driving vehicles, everything Facebook does when uh, with natural language processing, that is pure automation, or rather pure automated learning, supervised learning. There's a professor teaching a machine. So how does this work? Traditionally, knowledge was created this way. You have data here, and then you you tell it the data you want to work, and that will give you an output. It's somewhat, it's somewhat, well, right, you take the data, you let's say the algorithm, and then say, okay, now you can do this. For example, you have ingredients, you have a recipe to make a cake, and in the end, you end up with a cake. That's how something is created. What machine learning does is go the other way. You have the data and the result, or the output, and you have the ingredient, ingredients, and I say, I want a cake. And then a machine will say, this would be the best recipe. So it's the knowledge of how to create a cake. The knowledge to create a cake is the result. What I ask the machine is say, well, I, I say, I have these ingredients and I want a cake. And the machine figures out how to combine those materials. That's also very different from traditional education, where in traditional education, you say, OK, these are the data, two, three, and four. I have a program, a plus sign, parentheses, and a multiplier. And then the equal, and then what is the result? That's how we think. That that's our manner of thinking and educating ourselves. What machine learning does is go the other way. It says I have, and I have the result twenty. Okay, so what is the best way to combine them? This is the knowledge creation paradigm. So, how does this? Uh, well, this is the theory, but how does it look in practice? In practice, it goes the same way. I was working extensively this year and over the last two years with a mining company in Chile. In Chile, there's a lot of copper. And this mining company also uses algorithmification, where they have, for example, uh, a trench in the ground where they extract the ore. They have machines, and in the end, they want copper. And the machine decides what the best way to what is the best way to convert stones or ore into copper and this could be applied to the real world and that's what these companies do these companies are taking over the world let's take uber as an example uber is i think the largest transportation company in the world now but not only in taxi transportation although they don't own any taxis that's interesting as well Airbnb is the same. They're the largest uh, hotel chain in the world, but they don't own a single bed. They're larger than Sheraton and Hilton and every, everyone else. So what is their actual property? Their property is knowledge, knowledge of the industry, and that's it. So there are many taxis in the street. There are many clients that have certain preferences. There are many drivers, and then there are roads. And then what they do is take the data, just like I showed you in agriculture. It's always the same. Uh, I'm showing you different examples to show you how things work in a different way. So this reality creates a digital twin, just just like uh, with the land in Uruguay. Here they create a digital twin for each client and their preferences at what time they taxi. And there's also a digital twin for every driver, saying this driver uh, gets tired after four hours of driving. And there's also a digital twin, of, of course, for every street saying, OK, this taxi is on this side of the road and on that part, on that part of the town. But it's all data. They don't own any data, again. Or uh, they don't own any taxis, sorry. Uh, they, they don't own a single taxi or employ anyone. Well, in California, there was a trial where 
now to see if Uber drivers were employees or not. And they said, no, they are not employees. They are freelancers. They they're even more consumers than employees. They know and they know that very well. They know that they know them better than their own mothers again, because the data reflects their behavior and clients as well. And in the end, they come up with this platform here. And then we have the company called Uber up here. Here there are digital twins of this reality. And up here, up here at Uber, that's where I have machine learning, obviously. And and there are also simulations here. This might seem like back in the 70s, if we go back to the 70s, this might seem like the control room at NASA. That control room was not very sophisticated compared to what we have now. That whole room has the same computing power that I have on my phone. And that's how we got a man to the moon. So it's somewhat like that, right? Uber is the control room for all of the taxis or most taxis in the world. And here, they, they're basically running the world's taxis, but although somewhat more sophisticated because it isn't a room, it's basically an algorithm that I've called the master algorithm. They have a master algorithm on this industry. This master algorithm, uh, the industry wide, uh, they, they took the industry that way. And this is a concept that I use extensively, this concept of master algorithm. We can talk a lot about uh, this work with the industry. But, yeah, but we do talk about a lot. So the many, there are many industries like this. Sony Music, the great Sony Music, the owners of so many songs that we love, they, oh, sorry. Let's go to Amazon before Sony. So here, yeah, before Sony, let's go to Amazon. Amazon does exactly the same thing. Amazon is the largest retailer in the world. They ate up all of the smaller stores. They, they had the Falavellas and everything else, but they basically took over. But Amazon did the same thing. Amazon here has the clients or customers, has delivery, has consumer patterns, and then has storage. A digital twin was created for each. Amazon actually sends things, sends products that are close to you before you even thought about ordering them, ordering them, because it knows your behavior. It's quite intuitive. If you order diapers every Friday, every two weeks, Amazon will say, well, look, I'm sending diapers now because I know this person's going to order diapers again. And that's how they save on storage. Amazon has minimum storage. They basically have little or no storage. Uh, products are always flowing. They never stop because they can predict what you're going to order. Oh, you're going to order beer on Thursday. So they send it to a nearby location in the meantime, and that's how they avoid major storage that other competitors have. With knowledge, with knowledge of the consumer's patterns. And, and this goes for delivery as well. Amazon doesn't own any delivery companies, but it can predict exactly when the product will get there with their digital twins. And then, and again, Amazon is up here. It is, there's a digital a twin of this reality. Sony Music does the same thing. They own many songs. For example, they own the Happy Birthday song. Maybe the most profitable song in the, in the history of humanity. I think, I think they still make $5,000 a day in royalties. Yeah, over 130 years old, this song is. So Sony Music owns this song. Happy birthday to you. And and that's just like a taxi. That's that's the product. They own something real. But what does that matter? Eight, uh, Sony made 8 billion and Spotify made, made 9 billion in revenue. Spotify doesn't own any songs either. Spotify has a digital twin of the songs and they know exactly who likes what song and its respective royalties. And Spotify lives up here, up here not in the real world. Now, don't misunderstand me. There will still be value driving a taxi. There will still be value in owning a song. There will still be value in having a hotel bed. That value will not go away. But the growth of the economy, 
the 10%, the 20%, the 30% that we will be adding in the decades to come is created up here. So the taxi drivers and the songs and the beds and what have you, Amazon products, they will not lose value, but the economic growth will continue to uh, grow, or will, will, will continue. And this might seem uh, this this might seem a uh, little repetitive, and 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 I, and I would want to have a repetition. But let's go to retail, especially Latin America. Uh, 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 Chilean uh, retail depends on copper. We know this, and the added value that that is there's still value in ore containing copper, but the added value with growth is created in the digital twins of that where in the end they are combined and here there are many details that come into play but again the digital twin is created for every truck every rock and in the end the value is up here and this, this is what i always tell my colleagues in mining in latin america the only reason why elon musk and mark zuckerberg and other friends still have not taken over mining it's because it's not that profitable the automobile industry is is more profitable. Tesla is the most valuable company right now in in automobile. In automobiles, and my German friends were really surprised because they were quite arrogant, saying automobiles. Well, that's German. But no, the same goes for you know Hollywood, so taken over by Netflix. Someone could come in now and digitize the mining industry for Latin America. And natural resources because growth will be will be created up here again so there are many details that we could go into but i'm going to escape uh, some of these as far as how to create this part up here if you like we can talk about this uh, on, on on a separate occasion and then and education is the same look look at my classes i'm working at the university of california where we have 10 campuses and every campus you know that we have berkeley we have uh, UC, uh, ucla we have uc davis with agriculture they're all there but you know what my classes are available on the 10 campuses because they're online so all of these idiosyncrasies that have been created between the various campuses are still there and i also can leverage those 10 comp campuses I, I can go to santa barbara and record a class there with a colleague and then show my students here I have speakers constantly. I'm more, I feel more a documentary filmmaker at times. I take all these inputs and then at the end I show it. And I mean, and at, U, at the University of California, I have a thousand students per year and outside I have 40,000 students. 40,000 students is basically and all through basically con, content aggregation. So again, there's still value in giving a class and in, in giving class and and there will be value just as there will be with uh, a, driving a taxi and opening a, a mineral rock but what we add goes beyond that we know our students we know the learning patterns we provide content just like spotify right we know what content applies to whom that is growth and this is the same paradigm that can be used in education and we can go into the details on that as as well but I, I would rather prefer to i would rather not repeat myself and if you have any questions by the way uh they're very welcome uh please write them please uh send them in uh for the end so we take the digital twin from reality and knowledge and we automate and then how do we organize this industry well that's how it's being done now in the global economy then the power of the human with the artificial and this is really important when speaking of education humans humans will not go away anytime soon but they will change and we have to adjust the definition of of consumption from the from from the uh, a, a great uh, economist says that it is creative destruction innovation is creative destruction that is, you destroy something and creative, and, and with creativity, you create something else. We are reinventing the way in which knowledge is creating. With machine learning, you are creating knowledge. It, it creates knowledge. We say, we say that we 
we know where we want to go and they and, and the machine comes up with a how obviously education has to change and obviously the 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 labor the world of labor has to change and if we look at this and this is another classification of uh, uh, of uh, the industries uh, well, Point of three point four point oh, just like the internet. This is just data and information and communications, and this is four point oh. Uh, that is the Internet of Things. That's another technology matter that we can dive deeper into. But you can see that in fourth industrial revolution, the Internet of Things and the age of knowledge has increased. These are German figures, where we see that digitalization and data and communications destroyed employment, and knowledge increased employment. That's interesting. And now we can see what ranges and what ranges value was created in industry. Analytically, there was a lot of inc there was a major increase. That is a lot of data science. And that's why I have so many students as well. Interactive is also a really important aspect. Uh, interactive work, routine manual labor. Taxi drivers are extremely important. We will need taxi drivers. Those who are driving trucks uh, to and from the mine, uh, musicians as well, we need them. And, and with musicians, that is non-routine manual labor. That also went up. The only thing that was reduced was cognitive routine. Now look at this, cognitive routine. If I look at my day, if, if I look at my day, most of my day is cognitive routine correcting tests, cleaning databases, analyzing data. That's it's strictly cognitive routine. The education system as it is today, and, and I see my, my daughter's learning in, in school, uh, is all cognitive routine. How to do math, how to write with no spelling mistakes. That is all strictly cognitive routine that we learn. So this is the only thing that can be algorithmified with no issues. So there are major changes here that our system, that our education system is also not prepared for. Something else that machines can do, speaking algorithmically, is, well, I said in my previous slide that machine learning consisted of two things, right? One is data, reality, big data. And then the other is telling it where we want to go. That's how you train machines. So with image recognition, for example, you can say this is a motorcycle and this is a car. We have to teach it and and show it where to go. And in going where and in that final goal, that where to go, that is in the machine is indifferent to that. That's where we need humans. And ultimately that's where democracy comes in because if we want to get somewhere together Well, nobody knows what the future will, will look like. So, so we are sharing in that democratic responsibility. I mean, well, I don't know if, if we might be reverting that somewhat, but that's always been the idea. So it's really important that we humans know where we want to go. That's much more important than the cognitive routine because the machine, the machine can automate processes. For example, here we have machine learning. In machine learning takes data as inputs. And if we don't tell the machine where we're going, it will simply repeat what it always, what it already has. Let me see if I can explain that because I know that was a little bit confusing. Let's let's use this example. Let's imagine that this is a machine learning algorithm and you are the artificial intelligence. Now I'm giving you the input data. This is the input data I'm giving you. And now my question is, let's make a prediction into the future. How will this time series continue? Well, it will continue in the same manner. And there is nothing in the data that would indicate otherwise. You study what data gives you, and then you come up with a model to predict the future, right? So if you like a certain political party or a certain product, the algorithm will learn and will show you only things 
under that political party, and it will lock you in in this space where echo chambers are, are created, a technical term, where in the end, you will become an extremist for this political party. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the same thing happens. Machines or artificial intelligence will say, okay, you don't like this, so I'll show you this. The machine cannot decide to suddenly change course and create something totally different. The machine looks at Latin America and says, or analyzes, um, for example, uh, resumes and says, okay, there are different people applying for a certain job. So this person has a certain last name, a certain skin color, and we know that that people with darker skin in the U.S., for example, are more likely to end up in prison. Uh, those with uh, those who are females might uh, become pregnant and and stay less time at a job. Latinos make less money, so the machine says, "Okay, look, never employ somebody with this uh, of this sex, of this skin color, uh, of this." Uh, heritage, because the last 150 years have shown me that these people earn less money. So if you'd like a company make a lot of money, you would only employ white males with a European last name, because based on the data we have, they are the ones who have made more money in the last 250 years. That's what a machine would recommend. And in, in knowledge creation through machine learning, It all of it is optimized based on the past, and it condemns you to repeat the past. So you will create, I mean, if you only do machine learning with the data that we have now, the data we have on humanity are quite, it was quite problematic. So the data is now uh, uh, being fed into artificial intelligence, and that would be the recommendation. Artificial intelligence cannot on its own change course and change a Latin America change Latin America so that there is no poverty and no crime because there's no data on Latin America without these things. So that's where humans come in to establish the vision and to provide other things. And that's the theory. In theory, I can envision Latin America without poverty, without pollution, and without crime. In theory. But in data, not empirical data, because empirical data uh, don't exist. Artificial intelligence is machine learning over empirical data. Now, what do you need there then? You need, well, you need computation or computer theory, and that's what we're also working on. There is no doubt that computing can help here as well, where we basically do computational theory. This is, for example, uh, a city that I'm creating with my students that works off 100% renewable energy. So here we're changing, and this is without empirical data. We are simply exploring what is happening here. These simulations are, are also uh, quite strong now. And in fact, we should talk about it because it's really important that, well, up here, uh, uh, up here, I should explain this. Up here, we, we do not only do machine learning or artificial intelligence. We also do theory. We also do simulations to see where we might go. Because if we only stay with the data from down here, we are condemning ourselves to a past that wasn't as great, not as great as we would like it. So this is where humans come in. So humans, well, this up here, these aren't just robots. Things that the machine do, for example, the machine cannot say where we want to go. Uh, that's all I wanted to say with this uh, with this part. Saying data, well, humans don't need to do that part anymore. Machines could do that part, but the decisions and the theory that still needs some work, or, or rather, the the human side. And for this last part, and we only have five or ten minutes for this last part, and it's a major subject. Uh, 
and and I mentioned again that this is about the negative aspects. There are, there's much data about the negative aspects around the power of artificial over the human. As I mentioned, this changes roles. It changes what humans do, and it really uh, really affects our egos because we are Homo sapiens, and and knowledge is really important to us. The, our name says it. And now these machines come along and we say, whoa, what, what are they going to do? We are sapiens, after all. Uh, so there is a major issue here, and this issue has been quite ignored because it, it hits us in, in our pride. We always think, okay, machines, machines are quite powerful. But so, so powerful, not really, it's not really there. They're not better than humans. But we're always waiting for this point where machines where machine intelligence will surpass the best of human intelligence. That has a technical term called the singularity, the technological singularity. And the singularity, that's where the Terminator comes in. And that's where we will be uh, made into their pets. They're going to make us. Yeah, uh, and their, their batteries, like in Matrix as well. But humans were still quite good at certain things, for example. Uh, well, this is something we've been playing for years now, uh, uh, chess. In, in 1997, so 24 years ago, this was the last battle where we sent the best chess player, Kasparov, to play against the best machine. And obviously, we lost. But we said, okay, but it's a machine. That's, that's very mathematic. It's chess. But the machine could never interpret something qualitative, like an image. An image is very qualitative. Machines will never be able to do anything qualitative. In 2015, the machine was better than us. In, in recognition. Human, vo human voice is very human. A machine will never be able to, well, in 2016, the machine uh, uh, recognized voices better than humans. Okay, human faces. Okay, 2017 face recognition. And that's the game we've been playing. And while we've been playing this game, machines have been beating the best of us, the most intelligent of humans. Uh, we focused on that, but we lost sight of the fact that to dominate us, machines must overcome the worst in us, our weaknesses. And that's where machines um, are are, are coming in to look at our anger, our anxiety, our fears, and our lust, and the, the capital sins. That, And then we, we look at uh, addiction, the suicide rates, uh, anxiety, all these, you know, all these things like you know, on January 6th, where some guy with, with uh, bear skin and Viking and a Viking helmet took over Congress. That's where we see those things. That's where we see the results of machines taking the worst of us forward. That's where conspiracy theories are born and everything else. And this is also led by these companies. That is. You don't need to have a Facebook account. Google is monitoring 80% of every website you will see. The thing about Facebook, you could always get off Facebook. You can delete Facebook. It doesn't matter. But Facebook is still looking at 25% of any website you look at. And Google is reading all your emails. Amazon, 20% of every of every page, Amazon is monitoring it. Every digital step you take. Uh, it, I was looking at 20% of that. So you don't need to have a Facebook account. You can delete all of your social networks. doesn't matter. If you don't have a social account, they have an account for you. They already do. So they know us really, really well, basically. So what is the power of that? In Latin America, we are even uh, more that way. They monitor every step 
every digital step you take and know your fears, know your weaknesses, know your anxiety, know your envy, they know your weaknesses. And there, it's really easy to make, to commercialize that, to commercialize your weaknesses. In Latin America, we are also the champs for social networks. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, cream in that cream of the crop. And this is Latin America, Europe, in Europe is two hours and, but in Latin America it's three and a half hours on average per day. And that gives us uh, many more details. Just like we said at the beginning, with 150, well, with 10 likes on Facebook, I know you better than your workmates, just with 10 likes. And your workmate, you, supp you supposedly know them quite well. With 150 likes, they know you better than your wife or your mother. And with 200, 250 likes, they know you better than you know yourself. When you say, I know myself, I no, but artificial intelligence just can't know m me better than myself. But that's exactly what it does. And that's what leads to manipulation uh, for political campaigns and for commercial purposes, of course. So these powers have grown extensively. For example, well, there are many, uh, there are many, there are many features, and people are surprised when I say this. But with five of your pictures online, if you have five of your pictures online, the algorithm can detect your sexual orientation at ninety-one percent accuracy, just from your face. It's scandalous. Five of your pictures can determine if you uh, can allow a machine to detect if you're heterosexual or homosexual. And, and this exists. This is out there. In a world where 10 countries still ha apply the death penalty for homosexuality, I mean, with that, I, I would say things have to change. And it's really a human thing in, and in its culture. The machine doesn't do anything. The machine is just there. The machine is not the bottleneck. So the machine knows us very well. And you might have seen this documentary that I recommend you watch the social network dilemma. And, and there are actually a couple of interviews with me about this subject. If you want to see, uh, uh, for example, this website, the true source of power for networks has led us to has been about our own narcissism and anger, anxiety, envy. I mean, a headline like this doesn't doesn't fit in a single blurb, by the way. It's a long headline, but anyway, if you'd like to learn more about this, uh, because I, I am out of time, uh, please feel free to do so. But I would like to conclu conclude by saying that this paradigm is actually quite advanced. I can say that I, I, we can see how widespread this paradigm is look at YouTube and look at Facebook as well, but let's look at YouTube, which is maybe the most interesting uh, when it comes to the famous fake news. And I'll close with this. So just like I said at first, this knowledge paradigm is already there. It's in the economy, it's in education, and now it's in politics. It's in YouTube a few years ago, 10% of recommendations through the YouTube algorithm, this is what recommends the next video, that's where they have 70% of their business, was false news, conspiracy theories, or fake news. And I remember uh, uh, that it used to be very low. 5% of the recommendations under this algorithm um, uh, will lead to these results. Let's say you just want to watch one video, but you have to get up early the next day. One last video before going to bed. And then two hours later, you come out of this black hole and you, and you think, well, what just happened? Well, there's a supercomputer aimed at your brain that knows you better than you know yourself. And that supercomputer knew you didn't have a chance. Because two hours later, you were still there watching videos against your will. You wanted to go to bed, but you couldn't go to bed. You can't turn off the phone. You couldn't because our brain is no match for, for our supercomputer. So these algorithms are quite powerful and they have a power over us. 
and they are very widespread. If we look at a, an average YouTube user, they look at they watch 40 minutes a day, and 70% of that is recommended by artificial intelligence. That is, a YouTube user on average spends a half hour a day looking at recommendations from artificial intelligence. If 0 0.05 of that is conspiracy theories, that means there's a minute and a half a day looking at conspiracy theories. Because of artificial intelligence that is trying to maximize its earnings. That's 25% of the human population, of the global, global population. There are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, and there are let's say there are 2 billion Muslims in the world and 2 billion Christians in the world. And there are 2 billion users, uh, YouTube users in the world. So I don't know if your average Christian would spend a day and a, half, a minute and a half praying, but I know that that same number of people do spend one and a half minutes a day looking at conspiracy theories. Because of artificial intelligence that has been programmed to maximize earnings at a company in San Francisco. This is back to the question, who has the, the actual power, sovereign countries, or is it those business owners and their algorithms? Anyway, with that, I'll stop. If you'd like to learn more about this, I also have online courses with 40,000 students, again, that follow these courses. And I am online as well, so feel free free to send in any questions and here it is in Coursera you can find my courses these are five courses so feel free to choose these so in the meantime I will be I would be happy to receive any questions thank you Martin you you exceed uh, your legend uh, with uh, your words. You've surpassed it. Uh, we do have some questions. One is in English that says, like UN, uh, GG, uh, I am, are pushing worldwide uh, heavily toward the use of the digitalization. El, el grupo de, de observación de la tierra, como otros, están, uh, so the Earth Observation Group, as many others, are really promoting the digitalization of Earth observations for good. That is to counteract the natural disasters and to mitigate disasters and help in agriculture and climate to address the main challenges. But they can also be associated with other initiatives. So in this case, do you think the medicine might be worse than the disease? No, I, 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 I'm very, I'm very into digitalization. Obviously, uh, I'm a big fan. I mean, I mean, it's it's there. The paradigm is there. I think digitalization does do many things quite well, but I think that first, we'd have to see. Well, technology is neutral. It isn't a matter of good or bad. It can be used to create a very democratic democracy or create a, a dictatorship. That's not the fault of technology. The, the technology can do both. Humans, again, are still in charge of where we want to go. So the data is really important. It digitizes what we know about the Earth. That's great. But we have to be really strong in seeing where we want to go. That's why I was also saying that democracy has become debilitated in these uh, decades because we want to know where we want to go or, or, or we need to know where we want to go. And if the data is there and if humans say where we want to go, then artificial intelligence and, and automated learning and machine learning will tell us how to get there under that paradigm I showed you. We, it's not the other way around. The machine tells us the how to get there. So. I think what's most important there is that we not we never lose control of where we want to go, how we want to get there, to make sure that we get there without causing much damage. No, el, I think este that's important. I'm, I'm a big fan of developing 
proposals for good because it can be used for good. I mean, technology is quite powerful, but so far, the most brilliant minds that we've created to work in technology Uh, our, our, with that, our students end up working in two industries. One is uh, national security, that's basically spying in three-letter agencies. Those would be the biggest employers. With, they have 40,000 mathematicians there. And then the other is selling commercials at Silicon Valley. Those two applications are the most widely used, but nobody's put the money on the table to use this technology for democracy. No one has really put a lot of money on the table to truly use this technology for education. There are a few companies, yes, like Coursera and others that are trying to do that, but uh, it's not a lot of money on the table, not compared to uh, what we spend on national security and spying and, and making commercials. So a lot more money should be invested to develop technologies for democracy, for education, for health, that's, that's already starting. But yes, I'm a big fan of what technology, the good technology can do. Along those same lines, I have another question that that uh, is asking, what is your take on the Chinese, on the emergencies in China around the aspects you've mentioned? That is security, social control, social monitoring. What is your take on that new player international, internationally that leverages technology so much? Well, there's no doubt that China is a leader in these matters. It's not Europe or the United States. It's easy to understand also because China has big data. Again, artificial intelligence is just like automated learning, supervised learning. Uh, today, they're the same thing. And that needs to feed off big data. Big data is needed for artificial intelligence to work, and China has big data, not because of the size of what they have, because also they have aggressively uh, pursued this, and and all under one database, industry, government, it's all together. Here we have, th you know, we have Silicon Valley, then we have the NSA, the FBI, the CIA. They all have their own data and their own separate databases, supposedly but not over there and, and i'm exaggerating of course it's not that simple but they have big big data and with that they can do a lot of and i have no doubt i don't think anyone has any doubts that china is a leader in artificial intelligence now again technology is neutral if you want to use technology to create a dictatorship or a democracy technology will provide for both. So I I am worried about that as well because China has a, a different outlook as far as uh, where we want to go. It's always important that humans uh, direct where machines go. And that's something else that, that we're used to seeing in the world uh, as well in our civilizations. But China could very easily or is uh, very easily taking leadership there and that, and we really have to look at that because humanity could also uh, take several detours. I'm not saying it's the end of humanity, but I always say, look, the Middle Ages, it was the 800 years that were quite dark and quite long. And we recovered, and we recovered with the Renaissance and, and the Enlightenment, and then we recovered. But there were a, there were quite a few sad, dark years there. So humanity could always take the wrong path. And we are somewhat there now. We have to see how we are resolving this issue. And maybe if I were to show you one chart that also came from a discussion here, uh, it's about the US and Europe and regulations. Now that we're talking about China, can you see my screen? Yes. Now you can see it. Yes, perfect. So I just want to show you this data here, which is uh, really interesting. This is recently uh, this is recently published data. Basically, Europe and the United States have a different uh, outlook 
uh, on data protection. As you know, the, the general data protection regulation is in place where you must always accept before placing a cookie is Google monitors 80% of websites. 80% of the digital steps you take on your cell phones, on the internet, Google knows about it. Google sees all of that. And that Facebook 25%. But if you compare the US and Europe, there is no difference. Europe has that legislation in place, GDPR, and there's only 87% and 86 in the US. Doesn't matter. Legislation, but, but in reality, two, three years later, there is no major difference between the two with that regulation in place. So that's not a solution either in the world and in Europe and the United States. We have to look at that because China clearly knows where it wants to go. And we here saying, okay, we're like in Europe. I mean, I think this is a failure in legislation. It did, it did not make any difference, but we have to learn from these uh, failures and move forward quickly. And it does know that it wants to be data and they're leading uh, evolution. So we definitely do have to look at our work there. Thank you, Martin. We'll close with that. Many thanks to you. And once again, in, in Latin America here, uh, we will continue forward. Thank you. And, and please feel free to write. Uh, you can find me online very easily. And, and please don't hesitate to contact me for anything. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. We can continue the conversation there. Thank you. Goodbye. And thank you very much. We will now continue with the roundtable. And for that, it's a great pleasure to have all of you. I've been working with several of you uh, for several years. And this roundtable includes one of my heroes in Latin America. Uh, we have uh, Ida Holtz uh, for that. She. She led the first uh, group of women who received college degrees in Uruguay, and she has created a broad network that facilitated developing the Internet for Latin America and the Caribbean. In 2013, she was elected by the Internet Society, uh, or inducted, rather, into the Hall of Fame, the Internet Hall of Fame. From 1987, or rather in 1987, she directed the Central Information Services Office in Uruguay, where she led the Uruguayan academic network creation. All of the Latin American academic network thanks Ida for her drive in that regard. In 2005, or since 2005, she has been in the Uruguayan Information Society, and since then has had has made strong efforts in creating the the Uruguayan One Laptop Per Child program. Welcome, Ida. We then, on this panel, also have Paola Arellano. She has a master's in public administration at uh, the Universidad de Chile, and she also has a master's in industrial engineering from Pontificia Universidad Católica in Chile, with over 15 years of experience in corporate management and 20 in project management in Chile and internationally as well. In her professional career, she has actively engaged in research and innovation projects in many fields, both scientific as well as university, among which a series of programs can be highlighted, financed by the European Union, some of which I had, a, I had the opportunity to engage with them. And since 2005, she has been the executive director of the National Research Network and Education Network in Chile, addressing the challenges of using technology and advanced networks to 
to specifically advance astronomical studies, which is one of the largest fields that Chile has worldwide. For the entire astronomy community, Chile is key. We are also joined, welcome, Paula. Pleasure to have you here as well. We are also joined by Patricia Hernandez. She is a she has a doctorate in social science from Universidad Nacional Autónoma in Honduras. She has a master in communication sciences from Deral University in Rio de Janeiro. And since 2007, she has been the executive director for technology management at uh, the Universidad Autónoma de, Hondur de Honduras and has engaged in international projects such as the Silicon Network Academy to create technicians in technology regionally. We also have with us Mariela de Leon. She is a computer engineer from Universidad de la República in Uruguay. She has a certificate in technology management also from the La República University and is currently the interim director for information services at the university and the Uruguayan Ac academic network. In her career for over two decades, she has also engaged in development projects in Uruguay and several organization or international uh, initiatives as well. We also have Cecilia Paredes, a mechanical engineer from ESPOL, the Polytechnical School in Ecuador, with a master's and a doctorate in science and engineers from uh, an engineer from Rutgers University. And before being the rector, she was she was the dean of engineering of the School of Engineering, and has an impressive career in the Ecuadorian academic field. She is currently the chair of the Superior Council for Women Leaders in Higher Education for Latin America. It's an inter-American university program together with CIDIA, uh, where she promotes or, or drives uh, these academic networks through a series of projects in that field. So welcome. We will be speaking now. And well, that's it. Let's get started then with Ida to, to tell us what her life has been like. What are you here to tell us today, Ida? You're on mute. Well, my life is quite long. Very, very long, actually. So, so that might not be the most, uh, that might not be the best thing to talk about. I am currently a widow. I was married with, uh, I was married to an artist. 11 years ago, he passed away. I have three grandchildren, two children. And with them, I somewhat compensate for this uh, terrible uh, pandemic and the solace that it brings. To your question specifically on women, I still have many doubts there, although we've established this term, uh, women victims. And I think women's issues really depend on the culture of the place where you are addressing it and religion. I think currently we can see a terrible example of this. It's not a wonderful example. In the takeover of, of Afghanistan, they will especially allow women to study, but in places that are totally separate from men. That is, they cannot be, they cannot be mixed. And this happens in many countries as well. 
One example is uh, through my own ancestors. My mother never went to school because my grandfather, whom I never met, was a rabbi, quite religious, and did not allow her to go to school. None of the women, none of the sisters, uh, none of the six sisters were able to go to school. Of course, men did learn how to read and write, but sometimes uh, hiding away from their father in turn. And that has a lot to do with religion. I think you really have to differentiate or oh, we really have to address the difference, uh, the differences that women must face and look at the circumstances under which these things take place. In Uruguay, I never had any issues in studying engineering or mathematics or or, or even in becoming the director of information services, as the program was called before nor did I have any issues in Mexico. I lived in Mexico for 11 years, and I held very high positions in Mexico as well. So, I don't know. I wouldn't agree too much uh, with all these, uh, with all these, uh, all these issues are on women's rights. I do believe that we have to fight for women's rights, of course, where the rights do not exist. Great. Paola, what, what has been your main challenge in all the places you've been? Yes, thank you, Luis. I'd like to go ahead and, and, and greet all of my colleagues, and Ida in particular, whom I've been wanting to meet for many years now. Uh, and I would agree with Ida in, in that there's like this slogan that is always out there. And I haven't really had to deal with that either. I haven't had to terribly, I haven't had to terribly suffer inequality. Uh, uh, I've been in fields that have that are that are male heavy. I studied engineering, and that's mostly a male career. The very first time I, I went on to a I went on to a boat, for example, the fishermen almost threw me overboard. They didn't they didn't want uh, women coming on the boat because they, they said this will lead to women coming on boats all the time. So I've been able to I've been fortunate in being able to study and address greater challenges as a woman, although it's true that if you look at these statistics and you look at the figures, at least in Chilean universities and in Chilean industries, beyond education, we have relative gender equality in education, but in leadership roles in companies, there's a major difference. And, and just like Martin was saying about artificial intelligence and how the past is optimized, It's it, we're seeing the past projected into the present and future. In that case, in my professional career and in my education, I have not suffered that as much. And speaking of anecdotes, I remember that one time I met with I, I met at Marayare University, and the director was there with several other directors and researchers, and we were talking about you know very interesting matters. And then all of a sudden the the rector said, let's, let, let's have a toast. And I said, okay, let's toast. And he said, I'd like to toast the only woman at this table. And I honestly hadn't realized that I was the only woman there. That's my reality. It's not everyone's reality. I think that we do have to, we still have to work. There's lots to be done yet. And we do have to close the gaps as, uh, in both the universities as well as in a corporate world. And when it comes to leadership roles, women can address many challenges. And, and I also have the, the fortune of having two uh, wonderful university students as, as children. I hope to have grandchildren soon. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Luis, because I, I did kind of beat around the bush. Uh, you actually did, roughly. Patricia, in Central America, spaces are opening up for new generations to take the reins 
of their academic networks at the university. So what is your take in Central America around these two stories that we've heard so far that have worked out so well for them? Yes, good morning from Honduras. Good afternoon for the other attendees. I'm very thankful uh, for the invitation and for being able to share this time with all of you. Honestly, we are talking about a region, Central America, uh, just like Ida was saying, where tradition and religion are quite deeply rooted. Uh, that and that has somewhat hindered developments in that regard. But we're definitely talking about two things that can supplement each other when, for example, it comes to science development. We have been consumer countries traditionally for science. What others do, we have consumed it, but we haven't really positioned ourselves as such. As people who can we, we are people who can create technology as well and develop our countries and others. So when we talk about, for example, our network, I mean, I think our network is the newest of the networks under Red Clara. It's still uh, quite meager, but it really helps, especially when it comes to teamwork, especially when it comes to contributing to something. Speaking of gender specifically, just like Ida said, it, it's been more of a sexist uh, issue more than a gender issue. Because in a way, if we are women, we have certain obstacles when it comes to holding a certain position, upper management, or especially in technology. We're not talking about uh, a war of the sexes, but we are talking about this vision, this outlook that goes beyond that, that is more equal, uh, that allows for women's engagements. I'm the director of technology and on the network, there are 21 higher education institutions and I'm the only woman who is a technology director. The others are all male. So what I hope is that we, I mean, honestly, I haven't had really any obstacles, but quite the opposite. I have been leading many processes here as well. So all I'm saying is that inclusion has still has a way to go as far as incentivizing women's participation, not just because the right is there, but because it's necessary. It's necessary even uh, for the country's uh, GDP. If there's a greater female uh, engagement and participation, for example, at, uh, at, at my university, there are more women now studying than, ma than men. So if we boost that women's participation, especially in the fields of science and technology, we will also see that change. That's what uh, I've been thinking about uh, the networks and networks such as ours. Again, this might, this is, this is the, the new network when compared to other more advanced uh, Red Clara networks, but we are seeing this as a major opportunity that allows us to share and allows us to look at things in a, in a different light as women can contribute. And, and we see that we can boost and create knowledge and not just consume it. That's what I could say about that. Uh, thank you. Thank you as well. Let's go now to Quito. Well, or maybe Guayaquil, I'm not sure of the city, but yeah, I'm in Guayaquil. Okay. Okay, you're in Guayaquil, Ecuador? Okay. So you're not in Cuenca. That's okay. We're everywhere, actually. That's the good thing about networks. Hey, that's right. You're right. Well, I'm, I'm, in, and I work in physics. And part of what I do systematically is to not assign tasks that are traditionally considered to be quote unquote uh, women's tasks. If I'm at a meeting, uh, the woman uh, always takes the notes and we have to avoid that. So Cecilia, I do this consciously 
because it's kind of like the, sum, the sum of small things that provide a result where we don't have uh, women leaders. So with Cecilia, I would ask, why why would anyone include a gender approach in this advanced networks world? Does it make sense? I just wanted to have your take on that. Well, first of all, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here with these panelists. I don't know any of them, but after having listened to their stories and what they're saying, I am somewhat surprised that we have so many things in common in our outlook and in our experiences and in not, uh, and not uh, following the glass ceiling but working towards a better world. And, and to answer your question specifically, why would anyone include a gender approach in advanced networks? Well, because human work without a gender view will not work. It would be fragmented. In fact, it would even, even be defective in a world where men and women coexist. The gender outlook is key when conceiving any initiative that truly wants to better human development. To me, networks, advanced networks, such as the ones we're talking about, and networks in general, should be the best of the work in, in every sense, into science, technology, uh, politically, socially, in any field, men and women must provide their own contributions to resolve issues. A shared vision I'm convinced that a shared, vision, a shared vision should be taken forward when resolving any any issue, and that's where the work has to be done, especially in STEM. Participative and ethical work with men and women, that is the path forward. And that's what we have tried to do as well as CIDIA in having this outlook and in understanding that in a network, we have a variety of views, we have a variety of contexts, different realities, paradigms, convictions, values. So we have to really work in providing space for everyone in order to get to the goal that we want to get to. That to me is important. Ultimately, the vision, I mean, I always say it's all about human rights. Men and women have the same rights to participate and to propose solutions. And there, I think we obviously have to work on the gaps. We have to understand every country's issues. In our country, obviously, there's a cultural issue. There is a lack of role models. And I totally agree with Ida in that sense victimizing yourself i mean that's that's not something i do and that shouldn't be the discourse either we are just as capable as men our minds are just as capable as men and i think that we have to work towards equal opportunity and therein lies the work of all of us here and all the work that has been done previously and on a somewhat personal level i was looking at each of your stories and of course the first story that really uh, struck me was the many years of work that Ida has had and her vision. She says, I've worked uh, I've, uh, under dictatorships, non-dictatorships, and, and just like Paula is saying, we all share in these paradigms. So we do have to work, we have to build, we have to work as a team, men and women together to achieve the goal. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Mariela. Let's go to the south once again. And with you, I'd like to take a look at what kind of projects at your institutions have inclusion programs uh, uh, as part of their as part of their efforts. If you look at traditional programs, quote unquote, if you look at the quote unquote natural way in which for example, during the pandemic, I mean, what is, 
what researchers were most affected under the pandemic? And when it comes to male and female researchers, I mean, how do you how do you look at the nuance and allow for equality? Ultimately, all of you have have had uh, lighter experiences in that regard, but how would you address the issue? Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Great to see Ida once again. I hadn't seen her for quite a while. So I'm happy to see you once again, Ida, and I'm happy to share this time with you. As for the actual programs, well, let me tell you a little bit about the reality here through figures here in Uruguay. Uh, when it comes to university studies, although there are more women studying than men at the university, when it comes to science and technology, they are the minority. Overall, women have the majority, but in this field, they are the minority. And when and, and policies are put into place to overcome those differences. And there's another difference that Paola mentioned. In the earlier years in university, there is a majority of women. But once you once you get past to past four fifth semester here in Uruguay, that figure is reverted. There are more males than females. And why does this happen? Well, after many surveys and studies, this has a lot to do with care. Women at certain points in their lives become mothers and they will have to set some time aside for maternity. And that makes it so that there's less time for writing papers and researching. And ultimately, when competing for papers and research and, and their quality, that is where this matter really has a strong effect and that's how and that's why it affects later years in studies and for that the university has undertaken several efforts where many factors are taken into into account the age of the authors the time in which the papers are published it, it measures several things when looking at publishing papers. Conversely, the university is also engaged in an interinstitutional working group of women in science and technology, where 16 institutions in the country participate under a program called SAGA from UNESCO, which is trying to read indicators regarding gender and with that proposed public policy public policies for the country and to address inequality and with that several issues are driven forward there's also a program called ICT girls trying to have the young women and the girls who are not interested in technology studies uh, this is strictly for primary school and secondary school. Uh, the program intends to have, uh, or, or the program tries to implement programs and entertaining yet educational programs so that women are motivated to pursue technology careers. Uh, the dean was also a woman, the dean for the dean uh, at, at the school is addressing the issue that way, including uh, harassment. Uh, harassment issues. So there are programs that are trying to address inequality and trying to improve things. Specifically, in my case, I also have not had many obstacles in, in studying technology, but I do remember that there were certain misconceptions and prejudice around women studying what I studied. Uh, specifically around scholarships. And I remember the first interview I took with my grandmother, who was a social worker, uh, they told my grandmother, but she's a woman and she's going to study engineering. It's going to be really hard for her. Now, I didn't even have that in mind until this person said those words, but I continued on. And then 
during my studies, my my classmates, whenever we had to create a program or do a certain laboratory, they made me document. They said, okay, she's the woman, so she should do all the documentation. But I wanted to program, I wanted to create. So again, I had to create my own space, but it wasn't exactly very difficult, I must say. Today, the only challenge I have is around is around trying to to meet that the very high bar that Ida Holt set. But that's all I would say for now. Thank you. I do have a few questions uh, now that we did the entire round. And now I would just pose this question and whoever wants to answer can. The first question is, what do you think the impact of the pandemic will be in working in technology for women? Do you think that this juncture will allow women to move forward in the technology world, the pandemic, which has been the, the, the central issue from for a year and a half now, what do you think? If I could say something that I think uh, is quite relevant, women, when it comes to care, maternity and family, oftentimes cannot attend forums or other events uh, outside the country, because they have these um, let's say difficulties in traveling. But I think now, since all the forums and, and summits are online, I mean, they existed before, but now they're much more widespread. I think there lies a possibility where women could have better engagements and more access at least. I would think also that there are things in which we are different and that we have to keep in mind as well. That is, we are mothers, just like Mariela was saying, quite uh, accurately. And no one can substitute the role of a pregnant mother, uh, of a nursing mother, of mothers as a whole. In Mexico, I love Mexico, I, I must confess. I mean, in Mexico, I had an experience. I had a baby, my daughter, my youngest daughter. She was born in Mexico. And the place where she ultimately got a job had a room for women to go and breastfeed and change babies. And, 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 and to do things that cannot be substituted when it comes to gender. My, my, grand, my granddaughter asked, why, why don't men breastfeed? And we had to talk about that at that point. <laughs> and, and there are things that have to be kept in mind when, when it comes to women's development. We have to provide certain facilities in workplaces, not so that they, so that they don't stop working uh, because they are women, but instead provide a place in the workplace where women can breastfeed and change diapers and you know, have them have the babies take naps and, and what have you, because it is an actual need, and that is not often considered. Thank you. I have another question here that says, how can you compare the digital gap to the gender gap in STEM? Is there a relationship there? Do they converge or are they independent? Are they two separate things? Paola, you, you, I saw that you wanted to address that. I did. I, I did want to comment one thing to your question. But, but please let me know. Let me know when the time's up because I'll start talking and it's hard to stop. I, I just wanted to add uh, to the question on the pandemic as well. The thing is, when it comes to gender, at least in Chile, and this was wor known worldwide, Somewhat before the pandemic, I would say that, you know, 2017, 2018, at least in Chile, when it comes to university students and professionals at universities, a major movement began, and that has resulted in radical change at universities when it comes to thinking about the issue and, and, and creating awareness, specifically in the case of Chile, the universities came together and created a gender equality commission. 
This was in 2018. And, and they've been working not just on opportunities, but also just like Mariela was saying, they are also addressing discrimination. Maybe sometimes because of the way we were raised, you don't realize it. I look at my daughter and she says, well, you accept those things because you were raised in, in, in machismo. But in reality, it, it, it was kind of like a, like a slap back into reality. To me, I mean, it's normal. You normalize certain things that, that shouldn't be normal. And just like we saw with Martin's presentation on artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence projects the future world from the past. And we are in that same way. We project the culture with which, with which we were raised, but we have to be able to open our eyes and look and look at things differently. And that's why this uh, these things are so important. In Chile, a national equality policy was created under four ministries. There's a work plan with that law, and we're starting to see a lot of work being done. Uh, not so much results yet, but the work is ongoing. To your question specifically, if the digital gap increases gender gap, well, it is true that in general terms, women study STEM less, just like we've heard. The same applies for Chile. Significant work is being done here at the ministry level, at the industry level, to strengthen ICT capacity and to turn things around. And this could also be interesting, interesting when compared with the pandemic. I can now work from home, program from home. I can do things that would allow for equalizing those roles. This, and, and this would also include care, both for men and women, uh, child care. So the, the digital gap, yes, as long as uh, it's there, it could also increase uh, the gender gap but it's also an opportunity opportunity to close those gaps thank you paula from your view Pat patricia as a, a rector a dean that outlook that paula just mentioned also puts on a table a series of issues that uh, we hadn't uh, addressed before namely this resurgence or rather a surgence not a resurgence uh, of those uh, uh, discussions, not just around gender, but also around diversity and the need to, for example, in my school, in, in the School of Physics, there's 26 of us and only two are women. So that need to, to create something separate to compensate for what history has brought, is, is that something that you're considering? What is your take? Thank you, Luis, and thank you for calling me the dean, but I am simply the technology director. Yeah, Cecilia would be the dean, actually, there. Uh, sorry about that. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, though. Well, and, and I'm not going to ask Cecilia the same thing, so no problem. We'll, we'll save it. Okay, well, I would say it's really good. Uh, just like Paula was saying, there are many social movements now, and there's also an improved outlook in the sense of public policy, public policies that allow the countries to assume a different view on inclusion and non-discrimination, and of course, gender equity. I would say one thing, this is also shaped by the social economic situation that we're seeing in every country. Although it's true that there are many programs in place to incentivize around these issues. I mean, in, in, in our school, for example, we have a series of programs where female uh, participation is encouraged, special measures are taken for them. Uh, uh, this is also included in other STEM uh, programs, but what happens is that, yes, many of them do end up graduating and, and obtain their degrees, degrees, but when it comes to finding a job, these uh, women are somewhat hindered when it comes to science, technology, and mathematics because 
because of the social economic uh, situation in the country and also because of the culture and the tradition in place. So at least now there is, uh, there, or rather there are policies in place that do, that do address gender in all the projects uh, out there to incentivize things further. We had one event where what we did was encourage the women working in technology. And, and, the, and in the program, we invited high school students in to look at the situation. But our, our country's social economic situation basically uh, can make you cry at times because they are in high school, in, in a technical high school, but most of them at this event said, I cannot go to the university because of the social economic situation. Or, for example, they said, my mother cannot uh, buy a phone, for, a smartphone for me, so I can't uh, go online. Or they, they would say, since my mother works, I have to take care of my brothers or my siblings, so I can't undertake university studies despite liking the subjects. Because many say we have to incentivize them and incentivize women so that they like science and technology. And, and women do tend to like uh, human sciences and other traditional programs more, more than the ones that, that we've uh, studied. So it isn't just about liking the programs. We've always liked the programs. But the thing is, women's opportunities are somewhat molded by the social and economic situation in our respective countries. Honestly, those of us who are here today, we are privileged because we had access to university education because we've decided that we want to study these programs. We are people who lead projects and manage projects. So from that point of view, we oftentimes talk about percentages, saying that you you have to have a certain percentage uh, of X uh, gender in place. And I have to be honest, I'm not in agreement with percentages. In an, in, in an, an international body actually offered finance as long as we have 30% uh, women. That is 30% women have to at least be enrolled in those programs. And we couldn't... Uh, go through with the project because we could never achieve that 30 percent of women's participation so we're somewhat contradictory there might be other ways other ways to overcome the issue when we talk in terms of percent percentages i'm not too much in agreement with that because just like ida well said we ourselves are sometimes the obstacle so we will continue to incentivize, we will continue to address, we will continue to develop. And, and in fact, once I was at a, I was at a round table with Cecilia also uh, to talk about these matters. And we, and we mentioned this, that, that we sometimes place obstacles on ourselves as women. So we have to be really aware as we should be as women who are leading the way and women who are leaders and women who are moving forward. There are women who know how to do many things with few resources and overcome and resolve issues very quickly. If anyone can do it, it's women. So I would focus on the positive and lead the process as we go. I don't know if I'm even answering your question, but at least... Um, and I, I would say that we at least have to be very aware of the fact that it's things are moving along, but it, it is all formed by our respective countries and, and social and cultural aspects. We all have different social and cultural aspects and different politics as well. For example, Ida's life was molded because of political issues, political matters. So having a comprehensive approach to the issue um, uh, really helps. It isn't the war of the sexes. It isn't 50-50 men and women. 
with protests in between. No. If you don't have a more comprehensive view of the issue, that will always be an issue. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Cecilia. And, and what we're talking about here, well, obviously, there are historical moments, just like we heard from Paola, which led to the discussion uh, of a new constitution where certain of the, certain points are incorporated, and that discussion on the ground, on the social political ground, does create historical moments that can be leveraged, and that is clear. Now, there are situations, for example, in my own experience, where, where when I came to the university 10 years ago, the Santander Industrial University, I was in charge of a group, uh, a group that has been building interest in society for astronomy. Some eight, six to eight years ago, we created a series of workshops on astronomy for the youth. And the program went from 10% women to 30% women in five years because of that program. So the impact that you can create uh, does provide results. What is your take at ESPOL? What is your take in Ecuador? Thank you, Luis. Yes, undoubtedly, those policies around affirmative action or percentages do bring up a lot of discussion or, or do bring up many discussions. What I can provide are experiences. In Ecuador, some maybe 10 years ago, roughly, a new law was passed, actually in 2002. In that law, the entire educa the higher education system was changed. The system uh, with its good and its bad things has moved forward. In Ecuador, the higher education has moved forward. But in that transformation, gender policies were implemented through regulations and through incentives and through the model itself for university accreditation. Back then, if you look at the figures, the statistics, if there was, and I'm, I'm trying to remember because I don't have the figures, if you looked at women leadership, there was basically none, especially in public universities that cover 60% of the country. There might have been maybe one or two. Today, there are over 15 deans, rectors, because of that affirmative action policy at the public level, because there's a, there's a law that says that for public university elections, not for private because they have their own way of doing things, but in public universities, there should be gender parity. So if we're not deans, we are deputy deans, and that's where things become more interesting. Again, all of this with that vision of having men, both men and women, leading higher education, be it through individual efforts or even through the model itself. So there's something there. There's something there to think about. I'm not too sure. I mean, still 15 of 60 is very is, is a low percentage of deans, but before it might have been just one or two. So that, that's one example. At my university, it took 60 years to elect a female dean. We, we are all elected by the employees and the students. At National University, 150. In Central University, with four, that, that's been there for 400 years, they have had no female leadership. So there are issues to address. And, and we're not talking about merit either. It's simply about providing the space that otherwise would not be there. Surely, when, when, I, when I listen to what all of you have said, I, I realize that this is a challenge and an opportunity that addresses many fields. We have also led efforts at universities, uh, just like just like you have probably seen in your respective universities, where incentives are given to, especially the young women, to like science and choose the path. But it's also uh, something that has to be addressed by parents. I remember this one experience, um, well, it's been about 10 years, actually, when 
when we had students from the School of Mechanics where I was working, well, they have uh, student counselors there. And I, as a counselor, had a student who came to say goodbye because she was graduating. She came to say thank you. And then she started crying. And I said, okay, you must be very happy right now. And she said, honestly, I'm really concerned. And I said, why? But you're about to graduate. And, and I'd be happy if, if, I, if I was about to graduate from mechanical engineering. And she says, yes, but my parents wanted me to study economy. So on the parent side, there's a lot of work to be done in educating the youth, boys and girls. When people ask me how I educate my children, I, I'm sure I have many shortcomings, but I always say that I educate my son so that he is free to choose if he wants to. He is free to, to support his wife and stay at home as a stay at home uh, husband and father. He decided to leave his job and stay at home and help to raise the children. My daughter, if she wants to, if she wants to be CEO of a company or lead a certain initiative, she can do so without any taboos or any pressure or anything from my side. So, so ultimately, at the end of the day, the idea is that everything adds up. I'm not concerned so much about individual points, but instead about working in various fields simultaneously so that we can achieve what I believe to be the best goal of all, to have men and women working together. Thank you, Cecilia. And to conclude uh, with this message of everything adds up, we uh, have been driving this need to connect for 11 years here, and this need to create communities. Do you believe that at the call, we are trying to close that gender gap in addition to close the digital gap? That would be the first question. Is that your take? We'd, we'd like to hear from, uh, from you who have been with us for so many years. Do you feel that that is the case or should we emphasize other aspects that we haven't? I think the subject uh, hasn't been faced and it should be faced because there's something else there. There's something else there. Women in general do not choose uh, to do something and are hindered uh, by some other reason. There are many women who choose to not to enter into science. So we'd have to see why that is. It isn't necessarily up to the parents or to, to classmates or anything else. What is actually happening? I'm not sure what's happening. It might be a biological issue. Oftentimes, uh, many things uh, that involves many things, but the reality most or many women do not choose these career paths and we cannot, and we cannot force them either. We cannot impose equality in the field. And it's not that women are, are persecuted either in our country that that seldom happens, but it's really about what's in the biology, what's in that, in the thought, in the thinking, so that women are not choosing these careers. There, I wouldn't have an answer. I'm not sure, but there must be something in women's psychology that makes them more inclined towards social sciences than hard science, seems to me, though. I'm not sure there, Luis. I'm not sure if I would, if, if I'd agree that nothing should be done, but, you know, sometimes you do have to intervene. And Cecilia said this, after that change uh, that they had in Ecuador, there are now 15 women deans in the universities in, in Ecuador. And in Chile, there are five, and that's a major achievement after, uh, uh, or that's a major achievement uh, for 60 universities. So, I don't know about biology or sociology. I don't know what it is about biology or sociology that makes women less inclined to go into STEM, but we do have to leverage role models for that. I, I would even I'd, I'd take this time to thank Monica Rubio, an astronomer who just received the National Award, the, the National Science Award. 
we have uh, an astronomy program uh, that has several role models uh, that are similar to her. So I would, so I, I would encourage just awareness, awareness uh, about these women in these careers, in these programs. In, in discussions with our friends, we see how little culture we have. Yeah, a, a recently in a conversation, I said, or someone said, there are no female philosophers. And I said, and, and everyone said, what? Uh, there are so many women working in philosophy. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a major drive to make them more visible. That is true. We have the responsibility of making them visible, making these women visible to change those mindsets. I don't know if it's about biology. I don't know if it's about um, a change in mindset. But I think Tikal is an ideal form to work along these lines. If I may, Luis, I totally agree with what Paola just said. It's about visibilizing because, yes, there are many women working in science and technology. And yes, there are many women, for example, uh, in Tikal. I mean, in Tikal here, you can see them. You can see how many women we have working in these fields. So. Yes, making women visible. I think programs should be uh, focusing on that too, on visibilizing. Uh, that's really important. I think things have been coming along. And in fact, TICAL is a space for analysis, for critical analysis, and, and to show everything that's been, that's been done. So women's participation is indeed quite important. And I think, and I think that word is really important to visibilize, visibilize the work that women have done, women's contributions so that we continue forward. And then we would have more role models, just like we mentioned, almost everyone has said we need role models. So that would provide for more role models because their work would be known. Thank you. And along those same lines about visibilizing, we have a question here asking, why are gender programs mostly geared towards women? Do you think there should also be an effort towards men? And that would be useful as well. For example, responsible paternity courses and, 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 and working at working at home and doing home chores, would that also help women? So I'd like to learn your take on those kinds of initiatives as well. Well, I can say that, yes, of course, that would help. Something that I, that I have pending to do at the university is to meet with the spouses of the professors who have who have uh, stayed at home while their spouses uh, study. This has happened at, uh, to many professors. Many professors and their families have done this. Even my own children sometimes ask, you know, why my son would ask would ask me, why does she, what does my sister want to do everything that I want to do? And I, and I always say because she, because she can. But yes, I mean, you jot that down very really quickly. And that is pending work. I think this has a lot to do also uh, with what Ida said about victimization. Programs are focusing on telling us women that yes, we can, that we are capable, and that we can make it. So let's please uh, do certain things. But in reality, a program of that type, I mean, a program, if there's truly a gender equity under those programs, then of course they should address those issues because, because we are capable of working together and sharing tasks and, and coexisting with our differences because there are differences. But just so that everyone's approach is understood. That I think would be more equal education. Okay, thank you all very much. Unfortunately, 
our time is up. A big hug all around, and we will continue in this work. And we will con we will continue to strive for a more equal world. Yes, you can count on us for that. Big hug to all of you. Thank you. Big hug from Honduras. Mariela, can you call me as soon as you can? Paolita, voy a ir a Chile cuando puedo. Paola, I'm coming to Chile as soon as I can. You are very welcome here. Please do. We miss you very much here. I miss you too. I miss you very much. Yes, we're happy to have you here. We could even go out. At least to the observatory, we can definitely do that. I now have the immense pleasure of welcoming Bianca, whom I've known for some time now. She's also a hero of mine. Bianca is the coordinator for the Brazilian program for open access. She has a doctorate in applied linguistics and has a diploma in law. And she works on the on the following aspects. And this really hits home uh, uh, to me. So it's uh, in she's working in, in in copyright copyright aspects and open science. She works in in Brazil as a member of the Open Access uh, Committee. She's the chair of Open Access Report Repositories as well. Bianca, to me, it is a pleasure to have you here, and I'm really interested in that regional ecosystem for open science that you will be talking about. Yes, thank you so much, Luis. It's a huge pleasure to be here, especially after a panel, uh, after such an important panel, after such a, um, I mean, how could I not, uh, uh, of course, address these issues? I mean, looking at women's movement, and, and if I may, uh, the first thing I would say to that is that we definitely need visibility. That is not only science as a whole, that of course needs visibility, but women, we do need visibility. And that's why I can say that it is, uh, that with uh, great pride, I am now a the chair of uh, my organization. That is, there are more women now in science and in, in upper in upper management positions than in science, and we do have to show that visibility because we do great things. I mean, we are great. Uh, I mean, look at our lives. We we have children. We have families, and and, and I really loved. Um, this proposal to to provide men's education for things to change as well but i am here though to talk a little bit about the infrastructure and i would love to begin by thanking uh, luis from red clara luis nunez and and all of you for your very kind invitation to be here today to talk a little bit to talk a little bit and to think together about infrastructure for open science. Let me share my screen then. As you can see, I have 400 things that are open on my desktop here, but let's see. Yes. Let me just minimize everything else and start presentation mode. Go into configuration. And well, the idea is to talk a little bit about creating a regional ecosystem for open science. But before that, although some of you already know about this, I think that, uh, again, visibility is everything. And with that, I will be talking a little bit about uh, La Referencia, which is the 
Open Science Repository Network. And it, and it really has a lot to do with that word, visibility. Our idea, our mission is to provide visibility to scientific productions financed with public funds in Latin America. And that to us, isn't just a task, but it's a major undertaking, a very complex effort that from the very beginning, well, our region is known as an open access region. So all we have to do then is organize the infrastructure. Today, we not only work with literature, we have, just like the rest of the world, began with the open, uh, open access uh, initiative in science, but now the world of science is working with research data, and La Referencia is now working also with research data. We have three main pillars, agreements, directives and technology under agreements that is a really important aspect of course i must also say that one of the aspects of our network is that there is government representation from the countries that are part of it so that in itself is already important because that way we have this we have a somewhat uh, easier path when establishing policies. In fact, one of our pillars does involve signing agreements to produce public goods and for interoperability worldwide and to create a significant partnerships with other countries, with other regions, and also to develop projects. But we are clear about one thing. The world of science moves and organizes itself based on developed countries. So it doesn't do us any good to think about guidelines or directives that are, that are worldwide or that are regional because we want to be in the game of science as well. So adopting international directives, international guidelines becomes very important in our work. And we do have very strong work and very well-known work worldwide. Again, I'm very, very proud of this in terms of technology development. In this regard, I can tell you, well, I can't tell you, the network can tell you uh, through a very important person, I would say an essential person, namely Lota Romatas, who in addition to being our executive uh, secretary, he's also the technology director for the network. There we work in development and developing and transferring technologies. Today, in 2021, we have these countries as member countries. We can see that we also have Spain, but why Spain? It, wasn't it a Latin American network? Of, of course it is, but given that Spain has a an historical relationship of joint work, joint projects with Latin American countries, and given the importance of having Spain as a member, well, Spain came forward and told us we can, I mean, ultimately we can engage, we speak the same language. So we found it quite interesting to involve them as well. They said, yes, we are Spanish, but we focus our efforts as a region, as a Hispanic region, a Latin American region. Let me talk a little bit about La Referencia here, the present and what we're doing today, as well as what is to come, what we're thinking about doing in the future. And, and it's the immediate future, it's, it's tomorrow. 
not the day after tomorrow, it's tomorrow. That is, we must do things as, as quickly as, or as soon as possible. So we've been working with the Research Data Alliance at the global level and also at the Americas level. Research Data Alliance is the international organization that is the strongest and most important when it comes to working with research data. It's really important to us to be there in alignment with them so that we can develop our repositories and data management. We also have a relationship with the Gulf, Gulf Fair Initiative. These are guidelines so that data is as open as possible, as localized as possible, as reusable as possible. We have some countries already working through their national agencies on Gulf Air. And I can give you the example of Brazil. Brazil has created a Gulf Air office for Brazil. At the Brazil level, I also know that several countries in Latin America are also working with the Open Government Partnership, which is the partnership for open government. And in that sense, Brazil has suggested specific work around the new ways of evaluating open science. We will be working on these matters in Brazil in 2021 through 2023. Because these are necessary matters when it comes to open science. That is, we must change the way that we evaluate the information and researchers. So we work on plans, guidelines, and data management policies for research data repositories. That is, we are organizing the infrastructure and helping countries to organize, maybe is a better way to put it, to organize the national infrastructure, which is a relatively new subject, but new in terms of infrastructure. We are also working very strongly on training. And in, in training, we will be signing an MOU with the RDA, I believe next week. And they are helping us in training. That is, we must train the technicians in the region in research data management. We also have the honor of participating on the Confederation of Open Access Repositories on the board, which in terms of international initiatives is the most important when it comes to treating repositories as a whole or addressing repositories as a whole. Here, the, the COAR addresses repositories, but also their evolution. So we are quite close to the core. And I must say and that it's really important in engaging in these international activities. Why? Because basically we must be seen. We, we must show that we are here. And this also is an opportunity so that we have a voice when it comes to formulating policies that will become international policies. In that sense, and we are quite represented when it comes to open science. When it comes to the country's development, we have the support of the National Infrastructure for Open Science, which is being developed by the ANID, the National Agency for Research and Development in Chile, from the initials in Spanish. Actions and efforts of this nature are extremely important 
when it comes to the infrastructure needed for open science at the national level. In that sense, Brazil is completing the data repository under the national agency called CNPq, which is one of the most significant Brazilian agencies in this regard. So creating a research data repository will be key there so that other agencies can follow this example. And this is what La Referencia does. So what some develop in in one country can serve for uh, can be used for future developments in other countries under the network we will have to have to implement unesco's recommendations regarding open science as well as most of you know there was a whole discussion around uh, that involved 151 countries to create these recommendations for open science. This forum has been very interesting because we have been able to, we, we have been able to change ideas and see how countries are positioning themselves when it comes to open science. And with that, a series of recommendations have been issued under this document. Well, this document hasn't been published yet by UNESCO in general. It will be submitted, it will be, we will be presented in the UNESCO assembly in November for its approval though. And then with that, because I don't think there will be any issue in, in publishing that because it's been discussed uh, throughout, we, with that, we would then seek out the way to implement these recommendations. And these recommendations are very timely because they will help to convince all of the stakeholders having to do with open science on these matters. So what are the challenges for La Referencia today. Well, one of the main challenges that we will continue to address is in creating legal national frameworks on open science in every country. Just as recommendations are important so that we might uh, work in our respective countries, legal frameworks also greatly facilitate efforts when it comes to open science. So we will con continuously uh, continue to drive this forward. I've been doing so for several years in Brazil, but I haven't been able to achieve it yet. I'm still in the struggle though. No one will be able to stop me because I will continue to struggle until we have the legal framework. That is fundamental. We must also obtain national or domestic, regional and international finance to support open science activities because regions such as Europe, they have global financing. Well, not global rather, uh, but uh, regional, regional financing for creating infrastructure, whereas we don't. We have the national budget, which can vary greatly and which is never, let's say, too fantastic for the work that we're doing in science. So we do have to find financing. That is, at every level, to support open science. We also have to find common infrastructure for data storage because Latin America does not have those, sor those common sources of financing. And when it comes to open data and, and, and papers, a certain infrastructure must be there, a more robust infrastructure for data storage. 
So we definitely have to create a structure an infrastructure at the regional level for data storage, mainly for the countries that do not have the capacity to do so, or that are still just starting out in working with uh, research data. That is key. We must change the way Latin American invest, uh, researchers are evaluated. The evaluations that we use today, and, and this is quite, it's, it's quite clear to everyone that they are not useful. That is, they are based on the developed world and our worlds are not developed. That is, we must stop following formulas that were not made for us and that do not, let's say, contribute. I'm not sure how to put it. That they basically don't support open science in, in our regions. So in that regard, we must do a lot of work. And here I would highlight the work being done by Claxon with the form FOLEC because they are discussing the issue. So it's really important to participate in these discussions, of course, because we do, I mean, we have the opportunity. Everything that's happening in our regions is an opportunity because we don't have visibility. Now we do have visibility. And we are a model that I can assure you is enviable. It is envied by many developing, uh, many developed countries. So why not also be a model for change in evaluations where developed countries, I mean, and, and this is what we're doing uh, uh, here. We, 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 we are addressing the model, but we definitely have to change the way researchers are evaluated. They are very poorly evaluated in our region. We have to work on increasing interoperability and the quality of metadata to establish the guidelines for Open, open, Air, open Air 4, which is a European project. And if we're talking about visibility, we must follow in the same steps as international initiatives. So we must increase data quality and improve in data interoperability through other initiatives at the worldwide level. We have uh, an asymmetry, as we know, uh, in our countries that does require prioritization and regional and international joint work. And we heard this today. At the regional level, and, and this is in fact one of the uh, one of the purposes of an, of creating a network. We have to help uh, countries that are at a certain point in development, and those who and those who are developing must leverage countries that are more more uh, that have made more progress in this regard. That's the whole purpose of networks, so that things can be leveraged and reused even in other countries in a region. When it comes to open science, we must recover Latin American research data that lies in domestic and, and foreign infrastructure. So people say, well, researchers don't really want to engage about or engage in open data, but that is not the case. Our researchers in all the countries in Latin America are providing their data to international infrastructure. Data is pure gold, and we must keep them where we are to be reused in our own research, for example, as well as to establish uh, memory uh, and, and preserve and preserve the data. It's always surprising to me to see the amount of data, research data, 
that can be found in international initiatives. So, so it's not true that researchers don't want to work with open research data. Oftentimes what they say instead is, look, I don't know where I should uh, deposit my data. I know this. So we definitely have to create that infrastructure for our researchers so that they can deposit their data in our own infrastructure. That is key. And we must also create a regional ecosystem for open science. Our call to action lies in two fronts. One, in developing CRIS systems at the national level. CRIS systems are systems used to create the research ecosystems where you have the researcher with financing, with the various deliverables, all together, this includes research data. The institutions themselves are found there. That is, we have to have all of that mapped. And in this regard, there are two projects in the region that are in development and quite successfully. They have not completed yet because this um, it, it is uh, quite extensive, the development. One is BR Chris in Brazil, and the other is Peru Chris. And here I would say that in this philosophy of sharing things and creating models, these models created by Brazil and also by Peru would then be reusable to the other countries in the region. It's really important to learn about our ecosystem, and, and we have databases that aren't talking to each other. They are not interoperable. So we cannot have that, broad, that overarching uh, view of the region uh, because of that. And another point that is key is developing regional infrastructure for research data. And in this regard, Red Clara called us together with other partners to start to talk about creating this macro regional infrastructure. This will be key. That is, our data could then be much more visible and we would be visible in international science because today, both financing as well as data and papers are very strong in developed countries, which means that we must do the same. That is creating the infrastructure and participating in Red Clara so that we can start to think about creating this all of this has been fantastic, fantastic, really, so that we can now begin to structure and think about what this would look like, how it would work. But this will be essential to our scientific development. And and I and I'm about to conclude. So let me say that la referencia is open access. La referencia is open science. La referencia is open to collaboration. Therefore, all of you, in turn, are very much welcome. Come in and, and create a relationship with La Referencia because our strength is in recognizing and respecting differences as a key tenet for international cooperation. Thank you so much. That's what I wanted to address with all of you, and I'm here for any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. We can go ahead and have a Q&A now. And I do have one question here, Bianca, if I may. Well, there are several questions, but I have one here asking, and, and this is a key subject. You've talked about open science and evaluations, researcher investigation or evaluations. 
Could you dive deeper into that? Because it is a delicate subject, given that researchers mm. establish their careers uh, through their papers, through their publications. So what are we proposing now as open science for future generations in that regard? Well, it, it is key. We have an, evalu an evaluation system, of course, that's been in place for centuries. And it is based on commercial infrastructure. That is, if you have money, you will very likely publish something in a magazine that has a certain impact. But all of this made us forget about something that is fundamental. Why publish? Publishing is communicating. It's communication. And communication is vital for science. So we don't have to be there, and, and, and I'll just speak naturally. We don't have to be hung up on these uh, commercial infrastructures. Why? Because we've seen, I mean, those infrastructures have made millionaires, and millionaires we are not. That is, science infrastructure, national science infrastructures in the region are not robust, nor must they play this game. Just to give you an idea, developed countries also started to work on this matter of evaluations, of researcher evaluations. That is, the impact factor cannot be associated with something that I have to pay for. I mean, we are a region that communicates, and therefore, we are a region of open access. Most importantly, the most important thing is to communicate science, not to necessarily publish something in nature, for example. It would be great because it's it, it's it's like the mecca for researchers to have a, something published in nature. I know that, I know that. But we must first think of scientific development as a whole. And scientific development will come faster and more consistently if we have that open communication. What's so important about open science? Well, it's it's about working with research data. And why is it important to work with research data? Well, because with that, you can then communicate. I mean, you can prove that a certain result is true, for example. Because today, we only imagine, right? We read the methodology, and we just imagine that, oh, yes, of course, I believe that the, the result is there. Yeah, I, I think I think that's right. But But that cannot be the case. I mean, what is it that, and, and, and going back to evaluations, what is it that we're doing? Well, we have to find other ways of measuring. We have to find other, we, we have to find a way to exchange ideas amongst the various stakeholders that formulate these measures. Usually these are science and technology uh, public institutions, and we have to tell them, look, do you want to privilege the commercial industry or science? And just start that open discussion because in general, the members of these groups are the ones to say how researchers uh, are evaluated. They are, best, they are researchers themselves, although with the power to establish national evaluations. So a, there's a different discourse there, which is no longer the discourse of communications or the discourse of scientific pursuits. So for example, in Brazil, what we've done is encourage open governance. And for that, we have invited in all the various stakeholders, be they the Ministry of Education in our case, It's also 
society, the Society of Researchers, the Brazilian Society for Science Development, together with the Brazilian Agency for Science, which represents researchers in addition to universities and research organizations, so that we can discuss the matter and say, look, all this is not doing well. So what change might be had? If someone were to ask me, okay, fine, but how? I would say, well, hang on a second, because this movement is still in a way more developed in Argentina, for example, by the FALEC, but, but we don't have the answers yet. We're still in discussions. But we definitely have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind the fact that we have to change, which is essential for open science development, so that we have science that can compete with science worldwide. That's basically it. Thank you, Bianca. I have two questions that go together. One is how is open science related to open data? And you kind of answered it uh, along the way, but the audience is asking that you emphasize some details. Sure. Open science. If you if it is represented as an umbrella, well, under the umbrella, we have several points, which might be called uh, pillars of open science. One of those pillars is open access to scientific information. Regarding that, all of all of our countries in Latin America are working for scientific openness. Another pillar for open science, because open science is the change in paradigm as far as how to do science. It is science that is based on collaboration. So just so that we can collaborate with each other, we must have certain strategies in place. The strategy for open science, and then there are other strategies such as um, open source software, open research networks. We have, uh, you know, uh, academia.edu and, and other initiatives for that. So there is an exchange there, just like in the past, before scientific journals. That is, researchers would exchange information via letter to talk about the progress being made. So we have to go back to this idea of scientific communications. Another pillar would be open education resources. I'm not sure if that's the exact term, but yes, open education resources. We have, let's see. Oh, there's also citizen science. Citizen science where at the collaborative level, we must think about why citizens cannot help in doing science. That is citizen engagement in scientific processes. And we have the research, open research data as well. That is, data is extremely important, just like I was saying. Data is at the heart of research. It's the, it's the foundation. It's what will determine if a certain research, uh, if certain research concluded successfully or not. It will allow for proving the results. Data harvesting can, and with data harvesting, that data can be used for other research. To us, this is key because that means resources are saved. When a research project uh, comes up in any location, part of the budget is allocated for data harvesting. 
So if I can use a harvest from someone else's work, then I won't have to allocate resources for that part in my project. And that's great for us, for we who don't have fantastic budgets for science, that is fantastic. It's wonderful. And I always say that any action, be they around open access or be they for broader open science, I would, it's, it's as though it was created for us, not for them. We didn't create all of that. Developed country, countries created this. So imagine, even they are thinking that it's more advantageous to open everything up and to offer everything for collaboration. So imagine how that is for us. I mean, for us, it's more than fantastic. I mean, there's, there's no word. So we're talking a lot about research data. And this would be the next step, where the world works together to provide research data openly. And if we want to be considered as an important region in scientific terms, then we must do the same. We must keep our infrastructure, our commercial infrastructure, of course, and everything else has to be struggled for. Thank you, Bianca. With that, we will conclude because we are indeed out of time. Maria Jose, you have the floor now to close this wonderful session uh, from this morning. I haven't gotten up from this chair, but I've been right on the edge uh, with uh, all these conversations. Thank you very much, Lise. Thank you, Bianca. And thanks to all the women also who engaged in the previous panel. Very admirable, all of you, Bianca as well. And to Martin Hilbert as well. Thank you. And thank you, Luis, for your help throughout the day. You helped us, as always, greatly. Before closing this second session, I would like to remind you that you can share your comments and thoughts on Twitter using hashtag ConfTical2021 and on this platform's wall. Don't forget to also visit the demos. They are great. And to learn about the experiences that are being had in academic groups worldwide where Bella Connectivity is playing a key role. We also have forums where we'd like to learn about your proposals and ideas. So please uh, make sure to visit them. And of course, visit the virtual stands that have very relevant and pertinent information on technology at our universities and networks. And of course, please remember to look out for those hidden codes to participate in our gamification initiative to make this session, these sessions much more entertaining. We have parallel sessions and workshops that will be beginning in a few minutes, so don't miss those. For now, I thank you for your presence and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all very much. Just got up, something's wrong I waited up with wounds on my feet Where will you be? Flickering through memories The Polaroids yellowed in the sun Longing